Our Father, we come into your most holy presence this evening and we give you thanks for the privilege that we have to meet in this place. Father, we thank you for this book, the holy word of God before us. We thank you, Father, that it is infallible. We thank you, Father, that the words of God speak to us through it. We thank you, Father, that from start to finish, it is perfect and true. And we thank you, Father, that even in this day, it can be applied to each of our hearts. Father, we thank you that it is forever relevant. We thank you, Father, that as we come to this book tonight, and as we consider the prophet Habakkuk, and as we pro consider the problems that he had as he looked around him, as he was confused and asked the question, has God gone missing? We thank you, Father, that the answer comes that you haven't gone missing and you're the God who is still at work. And Father, as we come to your word tonight, we pray, Father, that we will be encouraged in our faith. We pray, Father, that we will be challenged, that, Father, we, as we come to your word and look in the mirror of your word, that we will, be, will not just be willing to hear it, but also, as James instructs us, to be doers of it also. Father, we pray for those who would love to meet in this place tonight, but due to health are unable to be here. Father, we pray that you will draw close to them tonight. We, Father, we pray for those who will listen in on Facebook later on and maybe they're sitting in their homes and they're lonely. Or, Father, they're sitting in their homes and they have so many worries and concerns. Father, we do pray that you will bless them especially this evening and draw very close to them. And may your word come as an encouragement to them. Father, as we come to you now, we simply plead that you will speak. Father, we claim the words of the hymn writer and we say, Here from the world we turn, Jesus to seek. And Father, that is our prayer. We pray, Father, that your words will speak to each one of us tonight. Father, it would be useless if we came here and we did everything in our own ability. So, Father, we pray that your presence will be real amongst us, that we will know your presence, and the Father, that you will bless us as we wait on thee. So, Father, we pray all this in the precious name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're turning again tonight to the book of Habakkuk. I don't know how you want to pronounce it. I was listening to someone during the week, and they actually were saying Habakkuk, and they actually remembered it by saying, have a cookie, have a cookie. I don't know, but have a cock is what I call it, have a cock. That's how I was taught it in Sunday school and it stuck. Um, so you, my dad's here tonight and you can blame him because he was one of my Sunday school teachers. Uh, but it's good to see each of you along. And we're turning to Habakkuk, five books from the end of your Old Testament. And we're going to spend some time reading the first chapter and consider then the first verse of the second chapter this evening. Habakkuk in chapter 1 and then through to chapter 2 in verse 1 we're going to read tonight. And this is the word of the Lord, Habakkuk chapter 1 and the verse 1. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. And of course we remember last week he began to pray and he says, O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. And the Lord's answer comes, this unexpected answer that we considered last week. And the Lord says, Behold, ye among the heathen. Remember, we can translate that as you among the nations. God's at work amongst all nations. Behold, ye among the heathen, and regard, and wonder marvelously. For I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. 
their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far, and they shall fly as the eagle that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand. And they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be scorned unto them. They will deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power, the Chaldeans' power, unto his God. Now Habakkuk, he begins to speak again here, and he says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one, we shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and, O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Therefore, wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? And makest men as the fishes of the sea, as creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with the angle and catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag because by them their proportion is fat and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? I will stand upon my watch And set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he, God, will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Has God gone missing? Last week, as we began our studies in the book of Habakkuk, we considered his unanswered prayer. You'll remember that in verse 2 of the first chapter, how he was crying out and he said, Oh Lord, how long will I cry? And we'll remember how when he cried out to God, that cry, it became more desperate. It was two different words for the word cry in verse 2. And he was desperate to hear from God. He looked around him at the nation in Judah in the southern kingdom and he just looked at the standard of the living of God's people and he was distressed. He wondered why God was allowing it. And he cried out to the Lord and he was looking for answers and he wanted God to speak. And then finally, as we, as we looked at last week, finally God's answer came, but it wasn't the answer that Habakkuk was expecting. It was an unexpected answer. And God, he came along and he says, behold ye among the heathen. Or remember how we considered, he says, behold you among the nations. And we remembered how our God is a God, not just who works in our nation or not just who works in the nation of Israel, but he is the God of all nations and is in control of all things and loves all people and is saving all over our world. God is at work. We reminded ourselves of that. And God, his unexpected answer to Habakkuk's prayer was that judgment was coming. Remember the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, they were up in the north. And how God tells them they're coming down and they're going to punish you. And God was going to use this other nation. And this is really where we find ourselves meeting the prophet tonight. And tonight as we consider it, what I've described it as in the title that I've given our study tonight is A Wandering Faith. Now, he's going to wonder in two ways tonight. Last week, we looked at a wavering faith. This week, we're looking at a wandering faith. And he's in wonder in two senses. First of all, he's going to look at God. And we're going to be looking at verse 12. And he's going to step back. And he's going to be in wonder and in awe of who his God is. But then secondly, he's going to be asking questions again. You see, God answers his first question and God tells him judgment is coming, but Habakkuk still has more questions to ask. And we're going to consider those as we deal with these verses from verse 12 down through to chapter 2 and verse 1. The wandering prophet or a wandering faith. I wonder, have you ever asked yourself the question, 
Who is the God that I serve? Who is God? Am I familiar with all his ways? Or do I just know the parts that make me feel great? You know, he's a loving God one full of grace and mercy, one who is touched with the feeling of my infirmities, one who comforts his children when life is tough. And they are things that are good to cling to, and God's word promises those, but God is a God who is just, and he must punish sin. And this is what God's people are we're going to learn as God and speaks to Habakkuk through the book of Habakkuk, and he prophesies to God's people. And and judgment is on the way. Exile is on the way. I wonder, are you familiar with all of God's ways? You know, God is a God who does love us. And because he loves us, he must be just. But you know, even in the trials of this life, and Habakkuk is going through a trial, isn't he? He's been calling out to God. You know, I remember that little chorus that we used to sing in Sunday school, with Christ in the vessel, we can smile at the storm as we go sailing home. But you know, even to sing that can be easy. But see, when the reality of life starts to kick in, sometimes in the Christian life, it feels like the smile can be wiped away. So sometimes the smiles can just disappear. Maybe you've come in tonight. And maybe you're just feeling the loneliness of the home, maybe on your own. Maybe you're sitting here tonight and you're brokenhearted because unbeknown to those around you, maybe you have a bout of ill health and no one knows around you. No one seems to care, but God does. Maybe there's something in work tomorrow and there's a storm brewing and you're dreading going back into the workplace tomorrow morning and you're thinking to yourself, how can I face another day? Maybe your back's against the wall and you're thinking to yourself, how, how can anybody help me? But let me tell you this, God cares. We're going to learn this tonight. Well, here's Habakkuk. And he's came to the Lord, and he's been pleading for such a long time. And of course, he was concerned about the nation, and God has now come, and he's answered his first prayer. But to be quite frank, as Habakkuk sees it, Habakkuk looks, and well, it seems like God hasn't answered that prayer at all. In fact, the answer that God has given him, the Chaldeans are coming, and there's more problems on the way. And then it begs the answer, uh, uh, us to ask the question, how can a holy God use a wicked nation to punish his own people? You know, if God feels like, like the Israelites weren't living up to it, how on earth could he look at the Chaldeans and say they were much holier than his people? And Habakkuk, he's got questions to ask. But I love this. He's got so many concerns and so many unknowns, and he doesn't know where to look. But he starts to back up. And he starts to think about, what do I know about my God? There are questions, and he can't answer them. And there's many questions in our lives, and sometimes it's hard to answer them. But he backs up. He says, hold on a minute, I need to get to know the God that I serve. You know Psalm 41, where talks about how the sea's crashing and the heathen rage and all these things are going on and there's chaos in the psalm and everything is just terrible. And what does the psalmist say near the end of the psalm? When all these things are going wrong, what does the psalmist remind us? He says, be still. Be still and know that I am God. And that's exactly what we're going to find the prophet doing tonight. He's confused. He doesn't know where to turn to. But what he says is, well, I'm going to think about what I do know about my God. And I'm going to back up onto solid ground. He's in the swamp at the minute. He's in this swamp of despair and he doesn't know where to turn to. But the one thing he knows is he says, hey, I'm going to look and I'm going to ask the question, who is this God that I'm serving? And we'll see as we come to this. He says in verse 12, the first thing he learns and reminds himself about God, he says, 
Art thou not from everlasting? The first thing he reminds himself is this. He reminds himself that God is eternal. You know, if you look at verse 11 and compare this God with the God of the Chaldeans, they say that they will attribute their power, they impute the power that they have had onto his God. And Habakkuk, he's just been told this, and his first response is to say, well, hold on a minute. What is, what is their God? Who is he? Why, my God, he's eternal. He, he's the only living God. He is from everlasting to everlasting. That's what I know about my God. He's not like the God of the Chaldeans. He's not like the God of any other nation. He's the God from eternity to eternity. That's what I know, says Habakkuk. He says, my God is before time ever began. My God is the God who made time, the creator of time. He is the eternal one. He's outside the realm of time. This is the God that I worship. Before the Garden of Eden, when creation was made, God was there before it. And God was there after it. And the whole timeline of the history of this world, God is outside of it. He is eternal. He is the one who is above it all. Do you know what that means? I think this is wonderful. God, he was at the Red Sea when he delivered his people. When that's in the series, when the mountains were on both sides, when the Egyptians were coming after them, God was there. You know, God was there when Paul and Silas were sat in prison and they worshipped him. I want a trial to be in prison. What for? For serving the Lord. What a trial they were in. But the eternal God, he was there with them. And you know, praise the Lord, that night someone came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's how the Lord used that night. This is the eternal God. You see, here's the thing. His throne and his realm and his rule is outside of time. And he rules this universe eternally. He's not subject to our time scales. He oversees the affairs of this world. And we can say from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. And Habakkuk, I can feel him, he's backing already onto this solid ground out of the swamp because he realizes that his God is above all things. You know, we can ask so many questions this evening as a child of God, can't we? Why is there a pandemic spreading across our world? Why are God's people being murdered for their faith? all over our world. Why can't we freely worship here the way we would normally would, without restrictions, and sing as we would like, and shake hands as we would like, and hug one another, and enjoy our church family together as we would like? Why do wars rage across our world? Why are laws being introduced into our country that sit completely contrary to the book before us? Why? And I, from a human mortal standpoint, I don't have the answers. But like Habakkuk, I can back up and I can say, well, who is my God? My God is the everlasting God, who's outside the realm of time. That's what I know. What else does Habakkuk remind himself of? Verse 12, art thou not from everlasting? O Lord, my God, mine holy one. O Lord, he says. He reminds himself, secondly, that God is mighty. Lord, Yahweh. He goes on in the verse, and actually later on near the end of verse 12, he actually says it more explicitly. He says, O mighty God. Now let me remind you that this prophet, he's completely confused at the minute. He doesn't know what God's doing, but he backs off and he says, My God is eternal. And what else do I know about my God? He is mighty. He says, O oh Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, I am that I am. And then he says, O oh mighty one. And he reminds himself that God is not dependent on us. He doesn't need us. God is self-existent. Remember when God turned to Moses and he said, Say that I am sent you. 
You're standing in holy ground. Remove the sandals from off your feet. You might have problems, Moses. The Israelites might be crying out to me, Moses, but I'm mighty and I can deliver them. And God had set his plan in the inauguration and God was going to move and the Israelites were going to be freed from that slavery. God is mighty. But it was in his timing. God, he was going to use Moses. He was going to use Aaron. And he was going to send them in to Pharaoh and the plagues were going to come and God showed that he was mighty. And Habakkuk, he knew this. He, he knew these stories and he sits and he considers his God and he says, God, my God, he is mighty. Not a single thing happens in this world outside the will of God. God is the absolute personification of power itself. What hope does that bring the Christian in the trial tonight? Bigger than all my problems. Bigger than all my fears. God is bigger than any mountain I can or cannot see. Here's the questions tonight. That little course is bigger than all my questions. Bigger than anything. God is bigger than any mountain that I can and cannot see. Oh, God is in control, dear Christian, tonight. Not one thing could happen that God couldn't stop. Nothing happens outside of his divine will, and he is the Almighty One. He is mightier than the Chaldeans, and he is mightier than anything. And Habakkuk, in his language here, he understands the concept. He says, Oh, Lord. He gives him his proper title, and he says, Oh, Mighty One. This is our God. But you know, these two titles that we've given to God so far, that Habakkuk has given him, it shows a God that is holy, who is above all things. But I love how Habakkuk personalizes it. Look at the verse again. He says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, mine holy one? He say, what he learns, and the third thing he reminds himself about his God, is that God is personal. And he wants relationships with his people. Mine, mine, mine. I know thou art mine. Saviour, dear Saviour. I know thou art mine. Yes, God is above all things. Yes, he is mighty. Yes, he is eternal. But he's personal. And he loves you. And he cares for whatever situation that is pressing you down tonight. Is your back against the wall? Well, God is personal. He knows all about our troubles. And he loves you. And he wants you to take you each step of the way. You see, he's the eternal God. But he's a loving father. And he's a good shepherd. That lovely imagery that we find so much in Scripture. That loving father who cares for his children. And that shepherd who tends for his sheep. That's our God. And he loves you. This holy one is yours. Dear brothers and sisters tonight, I don't know what you're going through as you sit in that seat. I don't know. I can't enter into your mind. Whether you're doubting in yourself, maybe your faith is weak at this time, maybe you're wondering what God is doing in the trial. But whatever you do, don't lose the sense that you belong to God. Don't lose that. Never lose the sense that you are the apple of his eye. And no one can ever do anything to you unless God permits. And even if your whole world seems to be turned against you, even if there's thousands of Chaldeans on the way, never lose the sense that you belong to God. He says, my God, mine holy one. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. And I give on to them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which has given them to me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. 
I and my Father are one. You belong to the Lord. He has redeemed you. He died in the cross and he purchased your pardon. And one day you're going to be with him forever, eternally. This is the God who is the creator, who is above all things, who is beyond our imagination, and he wants to have relationships with his children. You and I don't deserve it. But we have a God who wants a personal relationship with you, and you belong to him. What a precious thought tonight. Well, not only is God eternal, not only is God mighty, not only is God personal, but the prophet reminds himself, and he says... God is holy. God is holy. Look at the verse again. Art thou not from everlasting? O Lord, my God, mine holy one. And then in verse 13, you look again and he says, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. What does this mean? It means that God, he can never look upon sin with approval. Any form of sin at all, God will never look on it with approval. His eyes cannot behold sin in an approving way. And Habakkuk then concludes that God, he can never be implicated in a sinful act. God is absolutely pure and absolutely holy. And you can almost feel in verse 13, Habakkuk, he's back in and he sort of says, well, hold on a minute, God. You're the eternal God, so you know what's going to happen. And these people, they're coming down from the north. You are a holy God, but they're sinners. And he's confused, and the new questions start to come in. But then he reminds himself that, yes, God is holy, and no matter what's going to happen, his ways are pure. Was this not drummed into the Israelites from day one? Through the Levitical law, they were told what was clean to eat, what was unclean to eat, what was clean to touch, what was unclean to touch. Was it not shown through various object lessons? The sacrificial system, the purity laws, they saw it through the tabernacle, they, they saw it through the feast days, they saw it through everything, through every way of the Israelites' life. Holiness was shown to them, an example of the, how their God was holy. Just a side note. We serve the same God today. And out of love for him and with the help of the Spirit of God who dwells in each child of God, we should strive to live holy lives. That means what you're watching on Netflix. That means what you're watching on all these things, Amazon Prime, whatever it is. That means the TV programs you watch, holiness. We serve the same God, and we ought to strive and feed our minds with the right things. But the truth is that the Israelites, they should have known better than to be living the way they were living. Sometimes we need to look in on ourselves and ask ourselves the question, should we know better? And what we're feeding our minds with, what we're reading, what we're watching. The fifth thing that the prophet reminds himself is this. He reminds himself that God is faithful. Look, art thou not from everlasting? O Lord my God, mine holy one, we shall not die. We shall not die. You know, some people would say to you, he's trying to convince himself here, I don't believe that. You see, God had a promise to keep with his people, didn't he? He had promised that they would never be wiped out. And this holy God, he's faithful. Yes, he's eternal, he's mighty, he's personal, he's holy, but he is faithful. Well, what do you mean faithful, you might say? Well, God, he's the God of promise, and he's the God who keeps his promises. He's never failed in proving that. And God, he made a promise with Habakkuk's people. He's never going to destroy them. Remember, he made that promise with Abraham, and then he, he confirmed it with Isaac. He confirmed it with Jacob. He confirmed it with David, and he continued confirming this promise. You know, in the Old Testament, they had no indwelling spirit. They had no New Testament that would show them, but what was in the mind of the prophets was this. Christ, I suppose, was in their minds in a prophetic way. 
but nothing of the instruction and guidance of the inward man and the assurance of the Holy Spirit dwelling within. So what could, the, where, where does this assurance, this knowledge, knowledge of God's faithfulness come from? Well, it comes from the promises. And what Habakkuk remembered was this. God has never broken a promise with his people. And he never will. Ever. And Habakkuk's able to say, we shall not die because my God is faithful. And all of a sudden you feel the prophet, he's backing out of this swamp, this wall that he was against, he's starting to feel at ease. He's realizing that his God is eternal, his God is mighty, his God is personal, his God is holy, and his God is faithful. Do you know what, dear Christian, tonight? For you, the same thing applies. Same eternal God is the God we worship. He is mighty in your life situations. He's personal. He cares for you. He's holy and he's faithful. But you know, of course, the prophet, he asked himself, who is God? But he's still got this why question. Why them? Why the Chaldeans? You see, he had prayed for a long time and God came with his unexpected answer. And he looks at this unexpected answer and he says, okay, I understand, Lord, that you must punish your people because they're sinners. You must come and you must chastise them and you must treat them in your just way. But seriously, you're going to allow them to come? They're worse than we are. Have you not been noticing them? They're an awful lot worse. And you know something, he was right. The Chaldeans, they had no regard for the Lord that we worship. Look at the end of verse 13. He says, why do you hold thy tongue when the wicked, that's the Chaldeans, devoureth the man, that's the Israelites, the people of Judah, that are more righteous than he? We're actually more righteous than they are, God, but you're going to punish us. Why? And he's confused and he's asking this question, why them? It's his second question. I mean, how could God think that they were right to be the Israelites' judge? You know, I've heard people asking the question at times, why does God use an unholy nation? Or why does God use an unholy instrument or an unholy person? I don't know how he does. I can't answer every question, but I know this. Every time he uses me and you, he uses an unholy instrument. Have you ever thought about that? And the thing is, Habakkuk, he's looking at this nation and they're, they're using their military machine and they're worshipping it. In verse 16 and 17, in fact, 15, 16 and 17, you'll find this word, their net. And it's this fishing terminology, of course, that they're casting their net out, but their net is actually their army. And they were just stamping out the nations around them like insects. That's, that's what they're saying. And, and the prophet is saying, well, God, why, are, why is this happening? Why them? You know, the prophet was asking the wrong question. He was saying they're more sinful than we are. Why are you using them? And he was playing spiritual top trumps almost. He was looking at them, and we can do that at times too. I wonder if you ever sat and said, well, I'm doing more than they are in the Lord's work. And why am I facing all the problems? And we ask the Lord, well, why, why is my life like this? Why not them? They're doing nothing for you, Lord. And look at all that I'm doing. But the question was wrong. It should have been why. His question should have been, who is more righteous? God's answer would have came back and he would have said, there is none righteous, not one. And you see, in God's eyes, all that mattered was this, not who sinned more or who sinned less, not who's more righteous than the other. But when God deals with men and women, that's not what's on his mind because there's none righteous. It's a misconception that. Because in God's sight, 
one nation over another. It's not what he's looking at. In his eyes, all men have sinned. Sin is the great leveler. When you got saved, God didn't ask how full your bucket of sin was. He didn't ask how deep died in sin you were. He didn't ask anything like that. He didn't ask how deserving of hell you were. All God wanted to know was how sorry you were in your heart and repentant in your heart. And all God wanted us to do was come to that old rugged cross and lay our sin down there where the Lord Jesus died, that perfect lamb who the prophets pointed to. That's, that's all that we had to do because the Lord Jesus Christ did it all. And that's the God that we worship tonight, the one who provided a way so that the Lord Jesus Christ could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. And all he was interested in was our repentance. That's what's important. The why question was the wrong question that Habakkuk was asking. Who's more righteous? There is none righteous, not one. But finally tonight, we find our third W here, and I love where we're going to leave the prophet off this evening. I think this is a lovely place to leave him. You see, in the book, where does he start? Well, at the start, you could almost argue he's in the valley because he's been calling out to the Lord for a long, long time, hasn't he? Then comes God's unexpected answer. And then tonight, he considers who God is. And then he asks this why question. And God hasn't answered yet. But what does he say? Chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and I will watch to see what God will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. You know, in the trouble and the trials, what does the prophet choose to do? Wait. Wait. You know, the story is told about that famous American preacher, Philip Brooks. And one day he was found pacing around his office. And someone came in while he was pacing around his office and they asked him this question. He said, what's the trouble, Dr. Brooks? And Dr. Brooks, he replied and he says, what's the trouble? He says, I'm in a hurry and God isn't. This is so easy to preach. So easy just to say. But don't think I've got this together. It's very difficult to practice. We must learn to wait on the Lord. Habakkuk, he's starting to lift out of this valley and he goes to higher ground and he goes to his watchtower and he gets on his knees and he says, I'm going to wait for God. We find in the book of Isaiah, chapter 40 and verse 31, I'm sure you know the verse very well, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. No matter how many questions Habakkuk had about his faith, his faith was being tried and tested. Everything seemed to be going wrong. The answers that he was getting wasn't what he was expecting. But he remained on fire for his God. That's what mattered. Moses hid in the cleft of the rock. And what are we told happened when he hid in the cleft of the rock? He stood waiting, it says, and I quote, till he saw the glory of the Lord parade by him in all his majesty. It says of Balaam that he went aside to stand, and I quote, in waiting for the revelation that God would bring him in. Numbers 23 verse 3. It says of Elijah that he was commanded to go to the mountain, stand in waiting for the revelation that God would come. But they all had to wait. Trusting God, even when it's difficult. I'm sure you'll have heard this illustration many times. Blondin was a world-famous tightrope walker, and early in 1859, he decided that he was going to be the first person to walk on a tightrope across Niagara Falls. 
and he set up his tightrope and the crowds were brought in and they didn't believe that he was going to be able to do it. But then he went across and, the, and he kept on coming back and forward and he did many things. He sat in the middle in a chair and he made his lunch in the middle at one point and the crowd began to believe that he could do it and had more and more faith in him. And then coming up to the end for his final act, he brought out a wheelbarrow. And he says, who thinks I can take this across? And they all cheered and they said, yes, you can. He said, who's getting in it? Who's getting in it? And they all went silent. You know, we can be like that with God sometimes. We'll trust him to a point, but when it comes to this trial that we're trying to bring down to our own logic and our own understanding, we'll go, hold on a minute, I'm, we need an answer now. Instead of getting in the wheelbarrow and trusting the Lord to take us across the tightrope. I wonder are we those who stay outside the wheelbarrow and just say, no, you go on ahead. Or are we willing to allow the Lord to take us through the trial? Verse 3 of chapter 2. This is what God says. He says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the time it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for We must wait upon the Lord. Faith means taking the word of God as it is in every part of our life situations. Why should we take the word of God as it is? Because it's the word of God. It means believing and having faith through the good times and the bad times. Ah, oh, but Peter, you're a young fella. You, you haven't got to the end of life. You haven't been through what I've got through. No, I haven't. But look at Habakkuk. The Chaldeans are on their way. They're going to pillage the Israelites. They're going to do unimaginable things to the Israelites. But he goes up to his watchtower and he waits. And he gets on his knees and he trusts the Lord. I will wait for you. I will wait for you on your word. I will rely. I will wait for you. I will wait for you until my soul is satisfied. Let me leave you with the words of Paul in Romans chapter 11, verse 33 to 36. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counsellor? Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. What are we to remember? In the trials of life, remember who God is and wait on the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, as we come to you this evening, we praise you for the reminder from the book of Habakkuk tonight of what an awesome God we have. How you are so far above us in every way. That you are mighty. That you are eternal. That you are holy. That you are faithful. But Father, we thank you that you are a personal God. And we thank you, Father, for our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who walked this earth and went through many trials and knows exactly what it's like to walk in human flesh, God incarnate. And we realise, Father, at times that we, when we go through the trials, can try and understand it by ourselves. But Father, help us to trust in you but, and not to lean in our own understanding but in all our ways acknowledge you. 
and you've promised you will direct our paths. Father, help us to be patient. Help us to be people who are constantly on our knees before our God and leaving our lives completely to thy care because that's exactly where we wish them to be. Father, bless us now as we come to pray together as an assembly. Father, we pray that our prayers will be a sweet aroma of praise and thanks to our God for you are worthy to be praised. We pray this in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.